Thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you uh, for everyone joining us this evening for this uh, Wednesday webinar event. Uh, my name is Mike Kalka, and I'm part of the clinical education team here at, at Medtronic Lung Health. Um, as many of you are aware, the technology landscape has changed in the lung navigation space. With new technology comes more studies. Tonight, we'll, we will be having an in-depth look at diagnostic yield. Next slide. Richard, please. This webinar event has the goal of attempting to clear the air a bit with the intent of better understanding how to assess diagnostic yields and provide a better comparison among some of these studies currently being reported. This afternoon, uh, next slide, Richard, please. Um, I would like to make everyone aware of uh, a QR code where we will be sharing this with everyone at the conclusion of the event. We do appreciate uh, you taking a short survey, giving us feedback on future, uh, on, on this program, as well as giving you an update on future programs. So again, we'll come back to this slide at the end of the event. So next slide, Richard. This afternoon, we are thankful to have two excellent researchers with us. Uh, Dr. Eric Fold is the director of IP at Mass General Hospital in Boston. He is currently the chief of the Complex Chest Disease Center. I would also add Dr. Folk was a principal investigator for the Navi Navigate study. Dr. Fabian Maldonado is an interventional pulmonologist and professor of medicine, thoracic surgery and mechanical engineering at Vanderbilt University. I would also mention Dr. Maldonado is the principal investigator for the Veritas study. So with that, I will turn the program over to Dr. Folk. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, Mike. Well, I, I don't want to consume any time unnecessarily. Thank you all for joining us today. And um, I want to give the mic to Dr. Um, Fabian Maldonado, who doesn't need an introduction. And many of you know uh, from his experience and uh, prior presentations in this topic. Towards the end, we will um, uh, take your questions and present them to him and, and hopefully generate some uh, talking points and lessons learned from prior studies. So uh, without further ado, Fabian, please take it from here. Thank you, Eric, uh, and uh, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully you can see these slides. Can somebody confirm to me that you're seeing the slides? Yes, we, we can. can, in great, fact, great. see your slides, yes. Perfect, perfect. I'm going to start by saying that when I grew up, I want to speak like Richard. Uh, Richard this is amazing. Your voice is like great. Uh, so I'm not going to do as good a job. So if I don't do a very good job with my French accent, don't hesitate to ask the question for clarification. I'll do the best I can. Um, it's been a long day for most of us, so we're tired. There's also quite a bit of noise outside my office. Uh, so apologies for that in advance. Uh, I'm very pleased to talk to you about this topic, and I'm by no means trying to imply here that I'm the expert or that I have the ground truth for this, but I think it's an interesting and important discussion to be had. Uh, and I titled this The Incommensurability of Apples and Oranges. And for those of you who don't know what this word means, I just learned what it meant maybe six months ago or so. Or so. It means essentially that you have no grounds for comparison between different paradigms. That's really what it means. And I think when we read the literature on navigation bronchoscopy, this is sometimes how we feel because everybody defines diagnostic yield differently and makes it very, very difficult to uh, compare studies, to some studies to other studies. Uh, and that's not even accounting for all the other confounding factors that we have uh, in studies in general. We happen to evolve in a field that has very little in terms of comparative studies, which is not the case in pharmaceutical studies, for instance, but something that certainly as a community we need to, we need to work on moving forward. All right, uh, these are my disclosures. I've got some federal funding for biomarker research and robotic bronchoscopy. I've got some uh, uh, investigator initiated trials, including Veritas, which just mentioned. I do some consulting, obviously, for Medtronic. Uh, and so these would be the most relevant disclosures here. Here's the kind of things we're talking about. This is a uh, small lung nodule here in the left lower lobe. Um, shot with my iPhone, really. <laughs> That's why you've got the, the picture of, the, of the, the arrow here. But this is a, a nodule that historically we would have gone after 
with CT gated biopsy. It's pretty far from the pleura, but that's really the only option we have until we started developing these new guided bronchoscopy platforms, including electromagnetic navigation. And more and more, we're going after such small nodules. And I think uh, this become kind of becomes kind of fair game for us to go after nodule, nodules of this size. You get several airways in the direct vicinity of this nodule. It makes it more uh, potentially applicable. I'm gonna try to keep an eye on the chat uh, as we go. And if somebody else can do that for me, that would be awesome as well. So TTNA remains to this day, I think by far the gold standard uh, in terms of nodule biopsies and pro probably for good reasons. We've got a pulse sensitivity that's reported above 90%. Uh, this is from a now fairly dated um, systematic review and meta-analysis from the ACCP guideline published now back in 2013. So 46 studies, more than 50 patients in each study. And again, a great pulse sensitivity with a relatively narrow confidence uh, interval given the size of the study. But focusing again on smaller lesions, the yield may not be quite as good, estimated between 70 and 80%. There are downsides with uh, TTNA. Uh, I think the typical downsides that are reported are the rate of complications, but I think that's perhaps a little bit overrated because in fact, the best data we have suggests that pneumothoraces that require chest tube probably in the range of six to 8% uh, and not uh, the 20 to 25% typically reported. But one major issue compared to bronchoscopy approaches would be that you can typically only target one lesion and then staging during the same uh, operative time is not possible, which is obviously a major advantage of bronchoscopy. The main disadvantage of bronchoscopy, at least for its conventional formulation, would be the low yield of bronchoscopy. So this is again from the same systematic review and meta-analysis from the ACCP guidelines published in 2013. Certainly a lesser risk of uh, pneumothorax, but again, a yield for lesions less than two centimeters in particular that is quite low uh, with uh, the ability to hit the nodule in 30% of the cases. So clearly conventional bronchoscopy with your conventional C-arm and, and good luck finding the lesion uh, is uh, insufficient. There's been a number of good systematic review and meta-analysis. In fact, Eric uh, just published one recently in Annals, annals of um, the ATS on electromagnetic magnetic navigation specifically, uh, reporting a yield in the range of 70 to 80%, which is about the same we had here in this older study, looking not just at electromagnetic navigation, but a variety of guided bronchoscopy techniques that include also thin bronchoscopy with radio ultrasound. There's obviously a very, very broad range of uh, reported diagnostic yield in this study, and arguably a difficult exercise uh, to undertake given the differences with which uh, authors have reported diagnostic yields in this study. But a range of about 70% diagnostic yield, certainly better than what historically we've been able to accomplish with conventional bronchoscopy. Uh, this is a more recent study from uh, George Silvestri and his team at MUSC looking at ages one and two, which were large uh, uh, trials looking at a specific biomarker in which uh, all patients underwent bronchoscopy. And in this particular study, looking back at a very large number of bronchoscopies with a variety of techniques uh, that included, uh, um, you know, uh, thin bronchoscopy, rebus, EMN, and, 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 and et cetera, and linear EBUS, the yield was about 70%. So we're about in the same range. And obviously this is affected by the technique with large proximal hyalur mass being certainly more suitable for bronchoscopy interrogation than more peripheral small nodules. So the size clearly is a factor here, uh, the location as well, as you can see, and whether there's lymph uh, lymphadenopathy or not. What's interesting is that the actual location of the bronchoscopy is not all that important, which suggests that most uh, physicians that undertake bronchoscopy know what they're capable of. And when they decide to select a patient for bronchoscopy, chances are they'll be able uh, to get a diagnosis. Now, this study is very interesting, and I think that a lot of people have talked about this for now many years. This is the Acquire Registry database study that was uh, published by David Ost and a variety of uh, institutions across the country that were both community-based and academic-based. 
And this was published in the Blue Journal, I think remains one of the most quoted uh, Blue Journal article uh, to this day. And what was remarkable about this paper is the very disappointing diagnostic yield of bronchoscopy in general uh, at 63.7%. And going into the details, there were numbers that were extremely surprising, like electromagnetic navigation alone below 40% uh, when combined with radio ultrasound, barely making it to the 50% mark. And so there were lots of questions about what is this telling us? Does this mean that EMN is just a terrible uh, a bronchoscopy platform? Or does it mean that when the nodule nodules are very difficult and the most challenging to get a diagnosis for. Uh, we just dust off the EMN from the basement, bring it back and try to use the most advanced technique we have available to try to make a diagnosis. And clearly somebody uh, who is only going to use EMN for very difficult to reach nodules is not gonna have a great yield That's, uh, that occurs by necessity. And so very difficult again to know what these numbers mean, but certainly, poured a lot of cold water on navigational bronchoscopy. And I don't think we've quite recovered from the shock of that study since then. Well, there's a lot of issues that explain, I think, why you get such variability in diagnostic yields across these studies. And the main, uh, I think one of the main uh, reasons for, for this variability uh, is, is how we decide to count the beans, right? So if you decide to uh, count positive hits a certain way versus another is going to define what your reported uh, yield is going to be. But I think there's more than that. And I alluded to it. I think there's clearly, I, I talk about selection bias. It's not really a bias. We know it's there. We're cherry picking by definition patients from the clinic that we think are going to be suitable for bronchoscopy. And so depending on what you have available at your institution. If you get fantastic uh, interventional radiologists that can biopsy just about everything in the body, as long as they've got a needle and arm strength and they're able to reach everything, then chances are you're gonna have a pretty good deal with your bronchoscopy or go after the, the easiest masses uh, uh, in the upper lobes. But conversely, if, you, if you're by yourself and you're the last person to uh, be able to make the diagnosis and you, get, you, get, you have to go after this small nodule such as the one I presented on the first slide, then clearly your yield is going to be uh, decreased. There's a major confounder as well, which is cancer prevalence, I think. Uh, it is certainly easier to make a diagnosis of cancer than a diagnosis of benign nodule for a variety of reasons, uh, but clearly in general, cancer is going to be a larger target to go after, but also in terms of how we define diagnostic yield, once you have malignant cells, that's a definite diagnosis, no question about it. When you get anything but cancer cells, there's always a remaining doubt that perhaps you've sampled an area that is not quite representative of the nodule that is being targeted. So, and we'll go over, you know, how we can address these things. Now, in terms of um, you know, kind of being shocked by the acquire uh, registry data. This is actually not the only time we've been shocked by study results. Uh, this is one of the very, very few multi-center prospective randomized control trial that we have in guided bronchoscopy. And uh, we were part of the initial discussions back when I was at Mayo Clinic about whether or not to participate in the study and for a variety of reasons did not. But all these folks involved are clearly expert bronchoscopists and some of them have reported diagnostic yield for this particular technique in excess of 80% consistently. And so this study was really looking at conventional bronchoscopy with a regular scope and a conventional C-arm and good luck finding the nodule versus what most of us thought was a just as good as anything else guided bronchoscopy technique, which was a thin scope, four millimeter scope plus radio ultrasound. The patients were randomized uh, to either the standard arm or the thin scope plus radio ultrasound. And there was some methodological limitation with this study. You can see that there is clearly some imbalance in terms of the, the numbers in the groups here. But, but again, a re remarkable achievement, a randomized study in our field is not every day that we see that, but look at the yields. They're absolutely horrendous, certainly disappointing with uh, less than 50% yield for what was considered at the time standard of care for navigation bronchoscopy. 
at least on par with electromagnetic navigation. And we're not talking about small lesions. I mean, these were masses in, in general, more than three centimeters, that for the vast majority of them had a bronchocyte, meaning an airway leading directly into the target, and most of them were solid. So all lesions that typically would look at and say, we've got a pretty good chance at uh, getting to these nodules. And this was a surprise to the investigators as well, because clearly at odds with the uh, uh, reported yields that they had published uh, in the past. And this has something to say about not being quite as um, careful and nuanced about how we select patients for bronchoscopy, right? Because now we have patients that could uh, um, potentially be randomized to either or, and, and we have to enroll them in the study. So we're a little bit loose in the way we're gonna select patients. I mean, for those of you who have done randomized studies, uh, it's always a tricky thing to enroll patients, even in what you think is a standard of care study. There's a lot of argumentation. And so you're perhaps a little bit more lax in the way we get patients. So what's the problem? Well, here's one problem when we talk about comparing diagnostic yields across study. If all you're going after is this kind of things, uh, which by the way, in this particular case, this was not a cancer, but it should have been a cancer. Uh, and, and, and you go after a population of patients that for 90% of them are gonna turn out to be cancer, chances are your yield is gonna be excellent, right? Uh, does this mean you're a great bronchoscopist? Well, it means that you're okay bronchoscopist, but I don't know about you know, an amazing one uh, uh, in, in the sense that you know, you're not necessarily going after eight millimeter nodules like some other folks might. And so uh, again, you, your diagnostic heal here will be by necessity inflated because of the prevalence of cancer and the type of uh, lesions you're going after. Okay, this is very different than, than somebody who would reserve navigational bronchoscopy for these types of lesions, for instance. So that, that is the point that when we compare studies across studies, we really have to balance uh, these studies and account for these confounding factors. And by the way, we have to account for factors, uh, confounding factors that we know about, like the size and bronchocyte and operator and, and platform and diagnostic detail definition. We also have to account for confounding factors that we're not aware of. And there's certainly a ton that I can think of that would never be uh, uh, recorded or reported in studies. Here's the biggest issue, I think, with diagnostic yield, and, and I've shown these slides a couple of times already. And this has to do with the way that historically we as a community have been defining diagnostic yield. Traditionally, and this dates back from the early days of navigation bronchoscopy, and in fact, bronchoscopy in general, and I would venture to say that this is the same for the majority of CT-gated biopsies out there. We've decided that reporting the diagnostic yield should be as follow. If you biopsy a nodule and you find cancer, that's a hit. If you biopsy something else and it's not cancer, and you have a follow-up that tells you you don't have cancer down the road, that's a hit as well. And that's a problem because if you look at this population of lung nodules here, 10% of which are cancers and 90% are benign, if you're the absolute worst bronchoscopist in the entire world, and you biopsy the heart every single time and you get heart tissue on every single biopsy, but none of these biopsies, none of these uh, nodules uh, become cancer down the road, then you're, by definition, your yield is gonna be 90% as well. And clearly you've got a problem here because at no point in time were you able to actually hit the target you set out to biopsy. Yet reporting the yield that way will inflate the diagnostic yield uh, and give you a false sense of, sense of success. So that clearly uh, is a potential issue. So I went over a bunch of studies and uh, looked at how the yield was defined. And this is by no means meant to be a comprehensive um, uh, collection of diagnostic yield definitions available out there. But these are by and large how people have defined diagnostic yield and I keep track of time here. Uh, here's a conservative way to define diagnostic yield. This would be the way that uh, diagnostic yield was defined in the acquired database study. You have malignancy, it's a hit. You get a specific benign diagnosis, such as hematoma, granuloma, or an abscess, you count as a hit as well. If you, be even, if you want to be even stricter about your definitions, and you would use the same definitions, but add at least a year of follow-up to show that none of these benign specific diagnoses actually were misrepresented cancers and you don't have any evidence of malignancy and follow-up, you count this as uh, a hit as well. Now, arguably, these are gonna be very close. And when you see, when I recalculated yields for a number of studies, 
um, um, these are typically very, very close. Now, the lose definition is the one that I mentioned on the previous slides, which is you hit cancer, it's a hit. You don't hit cancer, but you have no evidence of malignancy on follow-up. You count this as a hit no matter what. Now, I'm going to stop here and point out that I don't think any of these de de definitions is necessarily the correct one. Okay, so I want to make that very clear. It just depends. Is really what really matters is that we agree on the definition and that we move forward and we collect the data accordingly. We don't change the definition of the diagnostic yield, you know, uh, um, as you're doing the study, and you report the data as it is. But you could report the data with any of these definitions, ideally with all three definitions, and then you get a better sense of what that means. You have to take into account what's the what the population of patients that you're including in the study actually looks like. And that's a very, very important uh, uh, confounder there. So again, I think this is a first step. If you wanna compare studies, yes, sure. We need to have a common ground of comparison and use standardized definitions or at least report them all so that we can have some ground of comparison. But we need to understand that this is not the only issue here and that we need to take into account account for all these confounding factors that we also know about. If you look at the acquired database, again, this the ACCP registry data that had such poor reported yields, overall 63% and less than 50% for electromagnetic navigation. Cancer prevalence was 66.7%. They actually report on 336 patients in this study that had one year follow-up. Some were actually lost to follow up midstream in these 336 patients. So depending on whether you include these patients or exclude them, you're gonna get different yields. But if you look at the conservative and strict definitions for these patients and the loose definitions, then all of a sudden you're back to your usual diagnostic yields that have been reported across many, many studies. If you include all follow up um, missing as missed uh, uh, diagnosis, then all of a sudden your yields go down a little bit. That's because you're doing a sensitivity analysis where you're considering all these loss to follow up nodules as misdiagnosis, which may not be the case, which really arguably should not be the case. You're just trying to look at the worst possible uh, diagnostic yield, it gives you a range, uh, so to speak. And so again, I think depending on how you count the beans here, you get very, very different results than the results that have been uh, mentioned before. Same thing with the uh, Navigate study that Eric was uh, PI on, fantastic effort across gazillion centers, tons of patients, uh, clearly the biggest achievement in uh, navigation bronchoscopy research uh, to date. Uh, the reported yield was 73%. Uh, and excluding unsuccessful navigation, meaning you were not able to get to your expected target and you did not uh, pursue biopsies, then your yield was 78%. These are the negative for malignancy uh, lesions. And again, you see there's a quite a bit discrepancy between those lesions that had very specific benign material on biopsy, something that you can look at and tell your um, pathologist that for sure you hit the nodule. You've got homartoma, granuloma, clear infections. And then you had less specific stuff like benign inflammation, inconclusive, normal lung tissue, lymphocytes, et cetera. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to count these as hit. I mean, clearly there are inflammatory nodules where the only thing you're gonna find is inflammation, but it, it's gotta be clear how you report the data. And so again, the decision that was made for Navigate was to report on the looser type of definition, which is the 73% uh, diagnostic that we report. If you report with the other definitions, you get a lesser uh, number, which is not very different than what we had in Acquire and not very different than what we've had historically uh, with navigation bronchoscopy. Um, same thing with robots, These, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm cherry picking studies here because the, there are large studies, influential studies in our field, uh, and I think it's important to include them. I could pick any study out there and repeat the same operation and gain the same, get the same kind of results. So this was a retrospective studies on ro uh, robotic bronchoscopy, 165 patients with a reported yield estimated between 69% and 77%. Uh, and again, there was a very strict definition of how they were uh, defined the diagnostic yield. Cancer prevalence was a little bit less than other uh, studies with bronchocyte present in, in a majority of cases. 
And again, the diagnostic yield with at least six months follow-up, 167 lesions. Uh, again, there's, if, if, if you don't have any follow-up with uh, uh, evidence of cancer, then, then your loose definition can really make these numbers look fantastic. If you look at uh, more conservative and strict definitions, excluding loss to follow up or including them as missed during this sensitivity analysis that I mentioned earlier, you're between 60 and 65%. Does this mean that everything I've said so far um, has any implication in terms of the diagnostic utility of one technology over another? Absolutely not, because I, I, I'm repeating this, it's very important to understand. None of these studies are um, none of these comparisons would be accounting for all these other con confounders we've talked about. And that's really important. The only way to account for these confounders is to do a matched comparative study, potentially a, you know, a propensity score matching analysis where you're gonna account as best you can for all these known confounders. But I think clearly the best way to do this would be to do a randomized study where not only the known confounders but unknown confounders will be taken into account as well. And this is something that we'll talk a little bit uh, at the end. Now, when we tried to look at our own numbers and the technology we've been using is this fluoroscopic navigation with digital tomosynthesis, we decided to at least have some idea of how we did compared to the prior technology we were using, which was the conventional super dimension tower. And as you can see, we only looked at uh, specific malignant and specific benign diagnosis without follow-up. So the only yield we're able to report here is the conservative yield. And you can see that you know, for the six months before and six months after our diagnostic yield significantly increased. And again, our conservative uh, yield before using digital tomosynthesis was in the 55% range. And we're very quite happy with this. I think we're pretty thinking we we're pretty good with that, but uh, clearly have improved significantly uh, with lesions in general of relatively small size, uh, majority of them being less than 20 millimeters uh, and uh, with the majority not having uh, bronchus sign as well. Uh, we've reported on uh, slightly more nodules. I think this uh, was, uh, yeah, 363 nodules. And uh, with the cancer prevalence of 57%, the nodule size on average is about two centimeters uh, with the bronchial sign present in 24% of the cases, uh, diagnostic yield 77%. Again, reporting on the most um, a conservative way to define the diagnostic yield. So malignant is a hit. If, if it's benign, it's gotta be a specific diagnosis such as a hematoma, clear infection, uh, granuloma, plus follow-up of, of um, uh, one year to show that there was no evidence of cancer and all loss to follow-up were counted as uh, misdiagnosis. Again, does this mean that we're better than everybody else? Absolutely not. It might be that Otis Rickman, my colleague, has a 100% yield and he's like the living god of bronchoscopy and, and, and I just miss everything else and I just don't do enough. Uh, and and uh, so, so again, I think there's a lot of confounders here that we need to take into account before starting to just take these diagnostic health definitions and run with them. Um, and here's our uh, recalculated yield here. Uh, if we are very loose in the way we define the diagnostic yield, our yields look great. If we're uh, more conservative, our yields look a little bit not quite as good. So what are some of these confounders that we should account for when we look across studies and try to get a sense of which technology is going to be suitable for us? What well, presumably confounding factors that are relevant to your own uh, practice. Uh, and so if all you're going after at a big cancer center is big masses because your oncologist wants you to hit the big mass to get molecular studies, uh, then clearly the, the size is going to be uh, an important uh, confounder that you want to look at. Um, uh, but uh, upper lobe predominance, we know that long nodules in the upper lobes tend to be easier to reach, there's less CT body divergence, whether you get a bronchus sign, what your local expertise is. Again, if you get fantastic interventional radiologist, if, great. If you don't, then uh, you're gonna probably go after a different, a different population of lung nodules. What's your cancer prevalence in general? The definition, definitions we use, the pathologist that reviews these slides, we know there's, there's incredible variability across a pathologist in calling malignancy a malignancy and vice versa. And then of course, this whole question of all the unknown 
confounders that we don't know anything about that we cannot capture and for which really the only way to to, to uh, handle uh, these uh, unknown confounders would be to do a randomized study. So the message of this talk, and I hope you really like this slide, uh, PowerPoint suggested it to me, I think it's really cool. Uh, the, the, the whole point of this uh, talk is that non-contextualized diagnostic yield estimates are meaningless. And I, I, you know, I, I mark my words. I think if you only look at diagnostic yield without even bothering to look at the way diagnostic yield is defined, and you uh, just assume that one technology is better than the other on that basis, that is at best misinformed and at worst disingenuous. I think we need to be very careful how we talk about comparing different studies. But of course, this is not just about diagnostic yield definitions and we've talked about cancer prevalence and bronchocyte and upper lobe predominance and operator and, and, and a variety of other confounding factors that really should be accounted for when we start looking at uh, uh, across studies. Okay, one way to uh, deal with this would be to do a comparative study. We're doing this study that I'll just mention here. Uh, this is a uh, study that is uh, an investigator initiated trial funded by uh, Medtronic through their external research program. And we are essentially trying to compare CT-gated biopsy and navigation bronchoscopy. It's a non-inferiority uh, study. In other words, we've set a non-inferiority margin above which we will hopefully conclude that navigation bronchoscopy is non-inferior to the gold standard of CT-gated biopsy. If we've enrolled about 25 patients uh, at Vanderbilt so far, and we're opening at other sites now, the um, Number we need is 258. Uh, there's been a little bit of uh, uh, really no research at all during the whole COVID time. So we're, we're just uh, restarting now and uh, very excited about this study. Uh, these are the inclusion criteria. We take only nodules that are between 10 and 30 millimeters with intermediate to high pretest probability of malignancy. Actually, that's an old slide. It goes to 100% here. And then only nodules that occupy the middle or third, uh, outer third of uh, the lung to uh, play fair with CT gated biopsy. All nodules are adjudicated by an independent interventional panel. And that is primarily designed to limit the influence of cherry picking. And so if we think a nodule is suitable for bronchoscopy and CT gated biopsy, and every time I, Fabian Maldonado, select a patient for my study and only take nodules that I know are going to be great uh, for bronch, but terrible for ct gated biopsy, then we really haven't achieved anything. And so all these nodules go through an independent adjudication panel, which is kind of a pain in the butt to go through because it adds uh, complexity to the randomization process. But at least we have at least some guarantee, and nothing's perfect, but some guarantee that uh, these nodules are amenable to both interventions. Uh, the primary endpoint is the definition in the strictest sense, sense of the term as we've defined it, doesn't quite matter as much. And in fact, I don't think it matters in general, uh, as I pointed out, it doesn't matter how you define yield as long as you understand that there are different ways to, to define yield. Uh, for the purpose of this particular study, we have decided uh, to define it in the strictest sense of the term. Uh, and here's kind of the general outline of the study. Uh, if you do find malignancy, that's a hit. If you find organizing pneumonia, frank purulence, granulomatous inflammation, we still need to have um, um, some follow-up without evidence of malignancy before concluding that it's a hit. So a quite complex diagnostic algorithm, but uh, certainly something that will give us confidence in the results when we have them. And I will stop here. I um, want to thank the members of my lab, the member of, of the members of the engineering lab that I work with, the IPOG, which is running a number of the studies that we're involved with. Uh, and, uh, and I will stop here and take any questions that you have. And thank you very much for, for your attention. And thank you, Medtronic, for organizing this uh, discussion. Thank you, Fabian, uh, for uh, a presenting this uh, a controversial um, and um, timely discussion of the different technologies. So uh, after you um, after you went over this, let me ask you, how do you currently see the field in terms of where are we heading? I'm, I'm uh, waiting a little for questions to come up, but where do you see the field going from here? 
Yeah, that's a good question, Eric. Uh, I think uh, in terms of um, evolution of technology and implementation in the clinical space, there are uh, certainly issues there that I think are beyond our control. And, and one of these issues is the way that medical devices are cleared in the United States. Uh, 90 plus percent of all medical devices are cleared through the 510k pathway without need for clinical data in the vast majority of cases. And so uh, we know that for some of the technologies we use, the FDA has mandated and they go through the common you know, pre-market approval process uh, by which you need to provide some, some clinical data, typically a randomized study, but not always, uh, certainly less stringent um, uh, hoops to go through than for, for pharma, for instance, who need two large randomized control trial before deciding whether a drug is going to be approved or not. Um, and, and even with that, sometimes as we saw with the Alzheimer drug lately, you know, it, it doesn't, doesn't guarantee that you're going to have the right decision at the end of the day. Uh, so I think that there's that, that puts the impetus on us, as, I think, as a community to make sure that we have systems in place to evaluate these technologies as they come. And uh, something that you've done, for instance, with the collaboration of, of Medtronic, uh, looking at real life data for electromagnetic navigation is something that we should do for everything very quickly and implement it quickly so that before we have devices all over the country, we at least have a sense of what the real life uh, clinical utility and value of these things actually is. Um, that's, that's one thing. The other thing is I think we need to raise the next generation of uh, IP researchers. And there's a lot of very talented people that are now thankfully getting into our field to design robust comparative studies, whether there are Retrospective comparative studies, looking at you know, methodological ways to actually compare apples to apples versus doing prospective comparative studies, which obviously require a lot of time and, and investment um, and, 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 and buy-in from a variety of funders. And it's gonna be very difficult to convince the NIH to give us money to run uh, randomized studies of you know, um, robotic bronchoscopy versus, uh, versus Super D, for instance. But there's, there's foundation funding, there's, there's industry funding that can certainly be uh, accessed. And, uh, and uh, you know, with, again, I think with the proper training, the proper research infrastructure, the proper network, uh, I, I think these studies can now be uh, considered. And, and I, I see the film moving in that direction. You know, we'll get this IPOG network that we're trying to put together. I think that's a very uh, promising thing. The ABIP is trying to uh, uh, promote research in that field as well. And then, you know, grassroots efforts like what you've done, Eric, and what others have done, I think is, is great as well. So going on to the questions in the, um, from, the, from the audience, uh, the first one is how many patients have you enrolled in Veritas and how many sites um, are participating? So we have enrolled, I want to say 25, it's 24 or 25. I can't uh, remember exactly uh, since we really restarted after um, COVID restrictions were lifted in the research operations here at Vanderbilt. Uh, we were on hold for the longest time. Uh, and so um, we are about to open at uh, two or three other centers and we'd like to have six, it's between six and eight, depending on enrollments. I suspect we'll go all the way up to eight uh, and hopefully we'll be able to open at these centers fairly quickly. Um, yeah. Um, the next question is, um, uh, should we control in these types of studies for the variation in pathology like they do in the ILD trials? Um, or, or should it be done in a panel or I, I would I would extend that question of what is the what is the positive and what is the negative of having of having um, a central pathologist? Yeah, that's a really good question. And Eric, we've talked about this uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, and I, I'm I'm reading also in the in the chat uh, discussion here uh, the other the other question. So the the target end for Veritas is 258. Uh, and that is based on, um, I'll just answer this very quickly and then I'll go to your question, Eric. Uh, that is based on a 10% inferiority margin. So um, looking at reported yields in the literature of 90% for CT-gated biopsy and 70% uh, and for 
uh, conventional navigation bronchoscopy with 80% with, with our data. So that's what we're aiming for. Uh, whether these are correct assumptions, who knows, but we have to start somewhere. So that's how the uh, N was calculated in our power calculation for a non-inferiority uh, design. And why non-inferiority? Uh, because if we prove non-inferiority, we know that these these technologies are equivalent. Uh, if we prove superiority uh, with the same number, uh, uh, with the same methodology, we'll be able to show superiority. But if we are powered for superiority and don't get statistical significance, then really technically speaking, we cannot conclude that, that, that the two interventions are equivalent. Um, you know, so, so try to be purist about, about the whole thing. Um, in, I see Tim, Tim's question about, uh, about the prescription of number uh, of, of biopsies for, uh, for Veritas. We actually don't mandate anything but that needles be used because we know that needles uh, clearly seem to have a good and perhaps a better diagnostic yield than uh, forceps biopsies. And conceptually, I think that makes sense because when you have forceps biopsy in an airway and the nodule is not aligned with the airway, you're always gonna follow the path of this resistance and end up uh, biopsying next to your nodule. Whereas if you're aligned with the nodule, with the needle, you're gonna go straight through into the nodule. And so our, our um, way to proceed here at Vanderbilt is to use needles. And the other advantage of needles, even though some, many of you I'm sure can do a rapid onset evaluation with forceps, we can't. And so with, uh, with needles, we get the luxury of being able to see in real time whether we're hitting something or not. Uh, and so the, these two factors really account for us using needles almost exclusively. And once we have guarantee that we've or almost guaranteed that we've hit the nodule in question, there really is no point in getting additional uh, tools to try to biopsy the nodules uh, that would you know, expose patients to unnecessary complications. And so we just stick with needles, get a cell block that that's, we think is large enough for the studies that need to be done and, and stop there. Uh, so we're not mandating, uh, there's a minimum number of, of needle passes, uh, which I think is five. Uh, and, uh, but aside from that, we don't, mandate anything and every, everything can be done. Now, the pathology question is really interesting because obviously uh, there is incredible inter-observer variability in, uh, across pathologists. Depends if you get a general pathologist for, versus a, a specific thoracic slash lung pathologist, which institution you work at and, and how good your pathologist actually is. I mean, that's important as well. Uh, and so there, there's a trade-off here between uh, you know, generalizability and external validity of the study, and then uh, how clean your study is. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have central review for everything, like we have for IPF studies, then clearly you're decreasing the potential for being representative of what will happen once your intervention is implemented at a larger scale, uh, because clearly not all biopsies in IPF are going to be centrally reviewed. This is really specific to the study. And this is always the problem with randomized studies versus registry studies. You've got great representability on one hand and, and great methodological purity or, uh, uh, on the other. And, and so this comes with, with pros and cons. Um, you know, Lonnie Yarmas from Hopkins reported some data from, from his study on um, um, on another navigational uh, platform on Verum. Uh, and uh, they looked at how often the local diagnosis was overturned by a, an expert panel that was centrally re reviewing all biopsies. And they started with just benign biopsies. And so these biopsies were sent to central review and a, a significant number of them, and I can't exactly remember the number, but I think it was in the range of 10% were actually reclassified as malignant, right? So all of a sudden you get 10%, if that's the number, I can't really remember what it was, but 10% of your missed diagnosis that all of a sudden become, you know, uh, uh, actual hits. So that change your, changes your diagnosis yield quite a bit. Uh, but then they looked at the reverse because the assumption when we talk about pathologists is that they have it right every single time. It's a black and white thing. I think Eric, you made that point the other day is that, you know, it's, it's, 
you know, you, you, you send your, patho- your slide to the pathologist and, and it comes back with a uh, yay or nay. It's either cancer or it's not. Uh, but, but when they look at these things, if you spend a little bit of time with pathologists, it's, it's, it's shades of gray, you know, from very dark to very light. Uh, and so they have to make a lot of judgment calls. Um, and so, you know, when, 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 they, when they decide that a, a, a slide is, has enough material to call it malignant, we assume that it's always the case, but I'm not sure it is. And in fact, there's a suggestion from, from that same study that perhaps it's sometimes not. And so, uh, you know, I think for the purpose of trying to discover what the ground truth is in the context of a methodologically sound randomized controlled trial, it makes a lot of sense to have a centralized review, knowing that it, that is by necessity going to limit the generalizability of your results. So uh, along those lines, I think the next question, uh, uh, talking about reaching versus getting diagnostic tissue, um, it, there's a question about your concept of tooling lesion versus diagnostic yield. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, you know, the and again, I think that has to do with what it is we're trying to prove with the study um, under consideration. If we're trying to judge how likely the navigation platform is to take you to your uh, desired destination, which is to have the whatever instrument you use aligned with the nodule, allowing for biopsy tools to go inside the nodule, then your endpoint should be tool in, you know, in lesion, right? I mean, it makes a lot of sense because if, you know, why would you penalize any navigation platform because you miss some diagnosis when the navigation platform's purpose is to get you inside the nodule. Uh, if you're not getting a diagnosis with a needle inside the nodule, it's not the navigation platform that's the problem, it's the needle that's the problem. Uh, and so that brings the whole brings up the whole issue of, you know, what are the kind of tools we use to biopsy nodules? I mean, they're the same tools we've been using for, you know, 20 years. I mean, we've, now we've we've gone from, you know, rigid bronchoscopy and, and optic fibers running through the lengths of the fiber optic scope to robotic bronchoscopy with, you know, Xbox like controllers, but we're still using the same stupid tools, right? Uh, I mean, and, and, and they're, I mean, I shouldn't say stupid, they're not stupid, but clearly they, they, they have not evolved as quickly as the rest of the field has evolved. Uh, and um, so th- that brings up the, the, the point, I think the good point that there should be some, some research in trying to refine these tools. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we've reported as have many others, many cases with Convim CT where your nodule, your, your needle is in the nodule, but quote unquote, the nodule is not in the needle uh, so that you can see on three planes that the needle clearly is inside the darn thing and that you're not getting a diagnosis. And that's very obviously frustrating for patients primarily because then they have to get another study, uh, but also for, for, for the rest of us, of course. Great. Um, there's a question about robotics. Do you use robotics? Uh, what system and, and why? What's your consideration? Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, we I'm not using robotic bronchoscopy. I'd love to. I think we're supposed. I keep for the past year. I've been saying any day now we're going to get one of the robotic platforms, uh, and I see Otis is on the call, so maybe he can provide some some clarification to that effect. Um, I mean, I you know th- there are potential benefits with, with robotic bronchoscopy, as I understand it. One is, is the very fine-tuned distal control of the tip of the instrument, which is something that uh, you know, I could use, certainly. Uh, I think the, the, the fact that companies are willing to invest in this field is, is really promising and, and makes me feel very optimistic about about not just our specialty and our, and our line of work, but also uh, the potential benefits that we will be able to bring to patient care in the near future. I think that that's really encouraging that, you know, industry partners are now kind of waking up and realizing that lung cancer is a big deal that needs to be addressed. Um, and, and I, you know, I think more and more we're going to come to recognize that one of the main impediment to um, you know, to getting diagnosis with all these technologies is a lack of real-time uh, visualization or near real-time visualization with 
Cone Beam CT or digital tomosynthesis as um, uh, the SuperD platform has, as uh, uh, Long Vision has. Uh, and, and you know, you hear about portable Cone Beam CT, uh, C arms. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's coming on the market, which is going to be uh, uh, really helpful, I think. And again, that expands the opportunity for uh, the researchers among us to 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 do these studies and do them well. So, so it's a very exciting time, I think. And uh, it looks like we are almost uh, getting the robot in July. So here you go. Um, yep. I think Otis heard you on uh, yeah. <laughs> the reply. Um, from uh, Mike Calcutt, uh, one of our organizers and good friend in Medtronic, could you comment on the prevalence of um, cancer and how that may affect in different regions of the country? I think this is particularly relevant in Tennessee and how um, relevant this is in lung cancer screening and, and any updated criteria. Yeah, I mean, I mean, clearly I think cancer prevalence is, is, is a big deal. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've gone, I, I've moved from, from Mayo to Vanderbilt six years ago, and, uh, and so did Otis, who's on the call. I mean, we, we've gone from an institution that almost never uh, uh, considered biopsying peripheral nodules to being in a state where biopsying nodules is essentially a full-time job. And so, uh, and, and this is pr primarily due to the fact that you've got the combination of heavy smoking in this, uh, you know, uh, southern states plus uh, the endemic mycosis, such as histo here, but you know, it's 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 coxie in, in Arizona, uh, and so uh, having these two contributing factors make our 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 job, you know, um, well guaranteed for one, uh, but uh, certainly more more difficult as well, uh, and yeah, lung cancer screening is going to improve, so. Uh, in terms not of technology, because I think CT is clearly uh, here to stay and the way to go. And there's good data that adding to that may not be all that useful, that doing autofluorescence bronchoscopy or neuroband imaging with bronchoscopy for screening purposes is actually not, uh, not all that useful. But what needs to be improved is, is the selection criteria for patients. Uh, there was a fantastic study a few years ago by Ping Yang from Mayo that was, uh, I think, published in Annals of Internal Medicine, looking at 10 years of data at Mayo Clinic on patients diagnosed with lung cancer and how many of these would have been eligible for lung cancer screening, it was about 40%. And, and the main reason why these patients were not eligible for lung cancer screening is because they had quit smoking too recently. And so, uh, you know, that, that, that's a big problem. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, we know that selecting patients for lung cancer screening on the basis of, of, of the PLCO model, for instance, to estimate the life, you know, uh, or four-year risk of developing lung cancer is a much better way to identify patients than using the NLST criteria, which were not really developed for screening purposes, but rather to serve as, as inclusion criteria for a study where we would enrich for lung cancer patients. And so these are very different purposes. I think ultimately it's gonna be a question of, you know, what kind of big data can we leverage with AI and machine learning to identify patients from the get-go that would benefit from lung cancer screening? I think that's where we're really going to, uh, to go as a, as a community in, in, uh, in lung cancer. Um, the next question here is, um, uh, states all of our work points out to eventual uh, lung cancer ablation. In your view, do you see a day where ablation will replace SBRT or uh, um, versus surgery, or do you see it as a complementary modality? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not going to replace anything, uh, and it's definitely going to be a complementary uh, 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 intervention. I think, I mean, the, the I'm, I'm not a nihilist about this. I think there's going to be a place for ablation, bronchoscopic ablation, uh, um, and we're going to have to to think that out very carefully. Now, things take a lot of time. I mean, when I was a fellow, uh, in, I think uh, started my pulmonary fellowship 2006, they were starting two large studies on limited resection for lesions less than two centimeters, big North American study and big Japanese study. The Japanese study just like 
a few months ago released their data. The paper is not even published yet. It took all that time to get some data on limited resection for just less than two centimeter nodules. There's not even any kind of fancy radiomic assessment of what the tumor likely is, et cetera. Uh, and, and so, you know, ha having well-designed multi-center randomized control trial, uh, that's great, but that takes forever and decisions are gonna have to be made way before that. Uh, and so, you know, we're never gonna have a head-to-head -head SBRT versus ablation, uh, at least not in the near future. We're not gonna, we couldn't get a head-to-head -head surgery versus SBRT. There are multiple randomized, randomized control trials that were stopped prematurely you know, early on because they couldn't enroll patients. Um, you know, there, there are studies that are ongoing now and, and, and we'll see if they're able to enroll and provide you know, useful data. Uh, so we're gonna have to, to figure out how to position these different uh, strategies in a way that makes sense for patients. Uh, I think some of some of this will depend on availability. I mean, SBRT is great, but not available everywhere. And then there's this whole idea of, of holy grail uh, of, of the, the dream heaven of the interventional pulmonologist where you get a patient in the OR, you diagnose their cancer, you stage it, and you ablate the tumor at once. And I think for a very uh, uh, selected number of patients, this will be a possibility in the near future. And, and, and I think that's great. In particular for, you know, all these patients that have these indolent uh, tumors, you know, more subcellular opacities with adenocarcinoma, which we know the natural history of is, is, is much less aggressive than conventional lung cancer. I think there's clearly a niche there for, for, for bronchoscopic ablation in my view. And, and when you talk about time, um, uh, as you know, uh, 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 you were part of Navigate with Otis. Vanderbilt participated of Navigate. It took us uh, over four years. Um, looking back, um, what do you think, of, considering we needed the data on a single arm, et cetera, what would you... Uh, what would you take away as a, as a learning point of how would you do different the classification of the, of the cases and the follow-up? Is, is one year enough with the two years? Um, is, um, is there something that you learned that we could have done different to make the, the results, you know, yeah, well, I, I, first of all, I think, I mean, you know, you highlight the point. This is, this is uh, at the largest study on navigation bronchoscopy, uh, over a thousand patients. I don't know how many centers you had, like 29 centers, something incredible like this. Uh, you know, being able to, to wrap this up in four years is a huge uh, achievement. Uh, and, and it is very useful data because it reflects what's actually going on on the ground. Uh, and as I said, I don't actually think there is a um, better way to define diagnostic yield. Well, I should take that back. I think, I think there's pro it's probably more reasonable to have a more conservative definition of yield, but it doesn't really matter in the sense that as long as you've defined it a certain way and you're consistent and it's very clear how you define the yield, uh, as, as this study was, uh, was clearly uh, defining it, uh, I think that's okay. Um, what, you know, in terms of follow-up, well, you know, I think for solid nodules, one year is probably enough. I think there's enough data suggesting now that one year, one year is enough. Uh, the issue is for all these subcellular opacities, which can evolve much differently over time, uh, and sometimes evolve in a way that, that's different, where, you know, the, the size may not be all the story, as you know, but really the, 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 the distribution of, of histological patterns and radiological patterns with the amount of ground glass versus solid density. Uh, and in fact, we know that, uh, you know, indolent adenocarcinoma, about five to 10% of them, we actually, when they become more invasive, shrink in size, because, you know, you get retraction of tissues from invasion uh, that is getting more prominent within the lesion. And so, uh, you know, I, aside from these subcellular opacities, I think one year follow-up is probably good. Uh, as far as, you um, getting a single arm perspective study, 
that is representative of real life experience of, of this particular navigation platform. Uh, like I said, I mean, I think this is, you know, as good as it gets. Uh, it, 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 it limits the ability to compare uh, this particular technology to other technologies for the reasons that, that we talked about during this talk. Well, I think we have answered all the questions. I don't have anything else other than uh, thanking you, Fabian, for uh, going over this topic in, in uh, detail and providing your point of view. Uh, I would close with, um, I agree with you that uh, we cannot compare study one study against the other. Uh, because they are different, they provide different pearls of uh, wisdom. Um, I, uh, having experienced a lot of the pain over the studies and, and, and as a reviewer as well on how to classify, uh, I, I'm left with a notion that probability is a better way of uh, looking at this. And we're all trying to get closer to the truth but we will never reach it. Um, uh, but uh, with that, and um, a big thank you for, uh, for all your hard work on this and to Medtronic for sponsoring this. Um, Mike Calcutt, do you have any uh, parting words? And, and Fabian? Yeah, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Fabian, uh, Dr. Maldonado comment first. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to thank the organizers. Uh, thank you for having me. I think that's an important topic and uh, excited to see where the field is going. All right. Well, you know, fantastic job. Uh, thank you both for being here. Dr. Maldonado, excellent presentation. Uh, Dr. Falk, uh, again, uh, thank you for, for being part of this and, and moderating. So with that, I will close out the session. And again, thanks uh, everyone for for joining the call today and, and, and being a part of this uh, Wednesday webinar. Um, have a good evening, everyone.